My name is Marietje Schaak. I'm a member of the European Parliament with the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. Uh, I work uh, on topics on the intersection of foreign policy, trade and technology. Uh, and uh, I really look forward to this afternoon's discussion on internet governance and uh, what should concern us in Europe, what kind of uh, uh, collaboration we should seek uh, in, in specifically uh, approaching uh, two upcoming events, the World Conference on International Telecommunications in December uh, and also the um, uh, meetings of the ITU. Um, I'm very, very happy that we have a great panel this afternoon. Uh, I decided to split it in two to allow for the most interaction and uh, remembering what people have said instead of giving uh, you all an overdose of information. So we're going to start with uh, Andrea Glorioso, who works at the European Commission. Uh, then, unfortunately, a representative from the Council of Europe had to uh, uh, cancel at the last moment. But we're very happy that Dixie Houghton is here with Global Partners, and she will present the discussion paper that you can also find in a draft form in the back of the room. Uh, so feel free to pick up a copy. And then we're going to have time for questions and answers on their interventions. Uh, and then um, the second panel uh, will have uh, William Drake, who is uh, at the University of Zurich, and Marco Pancini with Google, and uh, Joe McNamee with Edry. So it's uh, a very dynamic and different um, perspectives that we're going to see this afternoon, and unfortunately also a representative of Ethno who had been invited uh, had, uh, had to cancel. Um, and then we'll have another discussion, an opportunity for all of your questions and concerns, and then we'll wrap up the afternoon. So since two speakers uh, were unable to make it, I think we'll have a slightly shorter schedule than had been anticipated. So I think we will probably wrap up around 5 or 5.30, just so you all know. But I'm sure everybody has busy programs, and that's OK. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, give the floor to Andrea Glorioso, who is the policy officer and team coordinator at the European Commission at DG Info slash connect. Uh, and uh, he also coordinates the internet governance activities in this unit and supports the development of relevant policy options. And that's exactly what we need to learn about. So Andrea, go ahead. Thank you, Maricha, and uh, good day to everybody. I hope you can hear me. If not, raise your hands, and I will move the microphone uh, back or forward. Um, so as Maricha has introduced me, my name is Andrea Glorioso. Uh, I'm a man, as you can see, even though I'm called Andrea. Andrea is a male name in Italy and only in Italy. Uh, this caused uh, endless problems every time I attended conferences. This is why I decided to grow a beard, just to make sure <laughs> there will be no confusion. Uh, as Marie just mentioned, I work in the European Commission in DG Information Society. Uh, the reason why my bio mentions uh, the G Info slash connect uh, is because, as some of you know, those who are inside the Brussels bubble more than others, uh, DG Information Society, my director general, is going to be restructured uh, as of the 1st of July, quite a massive restructuring, in fact, uh, and it's going to be called uh, DG Communication Networks. Uh, content and technology, if I remember correctly, and the abbreviation will be DG Connect. Uh, as far as I am concerned, I think everybody will be happy to know that nothing changes for me because I will still work on internet governance and related dossier. Um, now, more to the substance. Uh, I understand that uh, my job here is to provide uh, a brief overview of what are the main uh, lines of thinking, uh, uh, what are the main approaches of the European Commission uh, in the field of internet governance. So since Marija is not contradicting me, I assume that I understood correctly, yes. and I will proceed without further ado to trying to give some glimpses of our reasoning on internet governance. And I say glimpses because uh, as those of you who are uh, more into this policy process, uh, we know that the term internet governance, uh, which was uh, uh, defined uh, with uh, what was actually and is actually a working definition in the World Summit on the Information Society, is actually quite a large topic. Uh, you could think about it, or at least I think about it, uh, as a kind of an umbrella that covers different policies. Uh, it may touch upon uh, privacy and data protection, uh, cybersecurity, the use of ICT and of the internet in development, uh, etc. Now, obviously, uh, I, as a policy officer, do not and cannot cover all these various topics. So, one, of, one perhaps the main, uh, the main aspect of my job is to actually try to coordinate 
to ensure that there is a certain coherence within the Commission in all the different policies that are touched upon by the Internet. And in doing so, try to ensure that the European Commission, at the very least, and in those cases when the European Commission speaks on behalf of the Union in international setting, and I'm not going to bore you to death with a discussion on when that is the case, because after the Lisbon Treaty, everything is simpler, but it's still rather complex to understand when the Commission speaks or not. But the point is that uh, what we want to achieve is to ensure that the European Union speaks with a single voice uh, and uh, advances what are its strategic interests uh, in the different uh, fora, uh, institutions, organizations, uh, which discuss matters related to the global governance of the Internet. Um, in 2011, I think it was June 2011, Vice President Kroos, uh, who, as you all know, is a commissioner for the digital agenda and has the responsibility in her portfolio, she has the responsibility for internet governance. She gave a speech at the OECD high-level conference on the internet economy. This was the 28th of June, 2011. I remember the data because I wrote the speech, so it was, I had the deadline in my system and it was, uh, jokes aside, uh, uh, in that occasion she advanced, uh, she offered uh, what was and what is uh, her vision of the main elements of what she would like the internet to look like. And this vision, which I'm going to briefly explain in a moment, uh, which is called the Internet Compact, uh, which I discovered not being a, a native English speaker, I discovered that in English a compact uh, is a kind of agreement. Uh, I had no idea. It's also, apparently a compact is also one of those things that women use to put their makeup inside, but in this particular case it was not a makeup container, but a, a kind of a pol um, principle agreement. Uh, Briefly, what Vice President Kroos sees uh, as the internet that she would like to see is an internet which is based uh, on civic responsibilities. And this in practice means, uh, and I'm going to simplify because this is a huge policy discussion on its own, but the idea is that you can't really, in this environment, uh, it's one thing, of course, we have legislation, we have laws, those laws have to be enforced, uh, which is not always easy given the jurisdictional complexities of the internet. But we also have to make sure that every player, every stakeholder, understands that we are all part of an ecosystem and tries to advance as much as possible certain shared uh, norms and principles which are, uh, we like to think that in Europe uh, we do share, uh, not necessarily through hard legislation. Uh, Part of this is the, all the reason on corporate social responsibility, which as some of you know, the Commission uh, has been very active since years. Uh, and part of it is understanding that uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are moments in which self-regulation and co-regulation by internet players can achieve the results that we want to achieve better, provided that these self-regulation and co-regulation processes uh, apply certain basic rules in terms of accountability, transparency, monitoring, uh, etc. The second uh, aspect of this principle which informs all our work uh, when discussing and uh, when advancing internet policies is that the internet should remain one global internet. Uh, I think it would be very difficult, unless there are colleagues from China in this room, it would be very difficult to, uh, to be in disagreement that the huge value of the internet is the fact that it is one single global network. And of course I'm simplifying, there are different, uh, there are times when even EU member states, even the EU, uh, does not necessarily uh, support a completely full, fully free flow of information, more often than not because there are, there, is, there are legislation, there is legislation to be applied. But the core principle remains uh, that we do not want, as the Commission, we do not want to see the emergence uh, of different fragmenting internets. And by the way, this is becoming very relevant because I think it was two or three days ago, uh, a group of Chinese, I think it was one Chinese university and uh, some other Chinese organization, but three Chinese gentlemen uh, submitted uh, a proposal to the ITF, which as you know is the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, in which they basically proposed uh, a new standard uh, for, uh, I think they call it split DNS or something like that. Basically the possibility for each country to have their own uh, root DNS, uh, which again, as some, as some of you who has been involved in this know very well, it's been a contentious point for a long time. And I'm mentioning this only to say that the whole discussion about whether to have one internet or different national regional intranets uh, is not pure theory. It has not been theory for a long time and certainly today is not theory anymore. The third point, uh, uh, the third element on which we base our policies on internet governance, our vision on internet governance, is the multi-stakeholder approach. But let me 
qualify this because uh, multi-stakeholderism uh, is one of these words which I discovered, by the way, uh, is something that, is, that comes from uh, environmental policy. The first time that people started to talk about multi-stakeholder governance was uh, in the discussion on the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was way before the World Summit on the Information Society. But aside, uh, besides these historical, uh, uh, these historical memories, uh, multi-stakeholderism is one of those words, from our perspective, that uh, uh, they are fantastic for negotiation because uh, basically everybody uh, means different things with the term. So you can put multi-stakeholder in a document and you can achieve an agreement uh, on the text, uh, even though in the end different people understand different things with that term. So it is important for us, uh, the Commission, to, to make it crystal clear what we mean with multi-stakeholderism. What we mean uh, is that, A, there has to be the involvement uh, of the widest to the largest possible numbers of stakeholders, which by definition are people who have stakes in this particular, who have an interest in a particular subject, in this case the Internet. So, broadest possible involvement. Uh, listening to that is not, is not sufficient to simply involve persons. You also have to listen to their arguments and to their uh, interests, etc. Uh, you have as much as possible to, uh, to rely on, uh, here again I will use the term self-regulation, but in fact uh, it's about letting people that are closer to the problem deal with it. So, for example, when it comes to purely pure technical day-to-day -day operations of the Internet, uh, that's up for the, to the private sector to deal with, in cooperation with other stakeholders. What multi-stakeholderism for us does not mean uh, is that we outsource policy responsibilities, legal responsibilities to third parties. Because we, as a public authority, we do have uh, responsibilities which are enshrined in the treaties or in secondary legislation, and we can cooperate with third parties to enforce those, uh, that legislation, but we are never going to tell uh, a private sector operator, from now on, it's your responsibility and it's your right to decide uh, what is uh, compliant to European fundamental rights or to European legislation or not. That remains uh, a job for the Commission in its sphere of responsibility or for national public authorities in their sphere. The fourth element, which for us is very important, I keep on talking as a true Italian, but Marice, if you can just... A uh, uh, couple of minutes. Couple of minutes. Yeah. Wow, I thought 20 more minutes. Okay, so I will accelerate. Uh, the fourth element, which is uh, central to our thinking about internet policy, is the, uh, it's something that might appear as very technical, but it is not, in fact, which is the architecture of the internet. Now, people use the term internet to very often to refer to many different things. But if you think about the internet with a capital I, that particular network of networks has certain architectural characteristics that are peculiar to the internet with a capital I, and they are, uh, one can argue, that they are the reason why the internet has become so successful. I will just mention a couple, the decentralization, the large decentralization of the internet, uh, the end-to-end -end principle, mm -hmm. The fact that uh, mostly, mostly the intelligence mm -hmm. uh, and the decisions uh, rest uh, on the endpoints of the network and not at the center of the network. I say mostly because this is a simplification and it's not, not always that easy. As the European Commission, we finance, we fund uh, quite substantially a lot of research uh, in what we call the future internet. And of course, one cannot take uh, uh, what in the end is basically a very conservative approach and say the internet that we have today is the best possible internet and we cannot change it. On that we do not agree because we fund research, everybody agrees that the Internet of today does have problems in terms of, for example, cybersecurity, attribution, etc. People disagree on how to solve those problems. The point that I'm trying to make here is that when we fund research in the future Internet, we try to think very hardly about uh, what are the architectural characteristics of the Internet that has uh, produced the positive policy effects that we want to keep and ensure that our work on research and development in this area maintains those elements. The, uh, the following element uh, is uh, uh, that in our view the Internet must be we call it confidence inspiring. Uh, in case this is not clear, actually, if you listen to the various terms that I'm using, you will discover that each term, if you take the initial of each term, the initial will make the word compact. Uh, that's something that comes from our external uh, communication department that decided it would be a good idea. But jokes aside, uh, uh, the internet should be confidence inspired, and that's the second C in the compact, uh, which basically means that uh, uh, people have to 
be sure that when they use the internet, their security will be protected, their privacy will be preserved, and that they can have trust that nothing too bad will happen to them. To be absolutely clear, the Commission does not believe, neither in this field nor in others, that you can achieve 100% security in anything. That, that's absolutely clear to us. We do think, however, that there is a lot of improvements that can be made on the current internet. And if I can make a personal observation, having uh, worked in the internet environment uh, with various heads, including with civil society heads before I joined the commission, sometimes I have the impression that when you talk to the technical community, the internet technical community, uh, they seem to think that your average uh, father or mother or even your average person has technical abilities that nobody has. What I'm trying to say is that it's not enough when somebody tells you, and European citizens tell us, we did uh, two or three different Eurobarometer survey, when European citizens tell you, well, one of the reasons why I'm not using the internet is because I'm not really sure that nothing bad will happen to me when I go online. I'm not sure that my credit card will not be stolen. I'm not sure that my personal data will be misused. Uh, then people, of course, go online to social networks and give all kinds of personal data, but that's uh, different, uh, a different issue, I would say. So one thing that we are trying to do and uh, we will announce the Commission will uh, most probably adopt uh, an integrated strategy on cybersecurity by the end of the year. What we are trying to, uh, one of the main lines of our approach to internet governance uh, is to ensure that uh, uh, the internet, that internet is safe to be used. Your privacy is preserved, your security is preserved, uh, and uh, uh, the safety of, especially of children, uh, of minors, uh, and of people that have less technological knowledge uh, is preserved. And last point, yeah. yeah. And last but not least, uh, and thank you to Marisha for the patience and to you for the patience, uh, we believe that the internet should be transparently governed. Now, I use the term govern, not in sense of government, but in sense of governance. I know that many people jump on their, uh, on their chairs when I say governed. Uh, I mentioned before what is our view on multi-stakeholder governance. We do not want and we do not believe in a takeover of the internet by public authorities. We do, however, believe that the internet has become so essential on the global stage that we need to start thinking seriously about the geopolitical balance that this entails. And what I'm trying to say here is that even though we are broadly fine with the current setup of global internet governance, uh, we also think that we need to engage in a dialogue with those parts of the world which are not fine with the current setup. Uh, an, an approach which basically tells uh, the, I can name names because their positions are quite clear, that tells the Indians, Brazilians, South Africans, uh, even the Chinese and the Russians of this world, well, this is the situation and it's never going to change. It's, uh, to put it diplomatically, uh, is useless and is dangerous. Because at the end of the day, when we go to a discussion where numbers are counted, uh, we need to count the numbers and we don't have that many numbers. So what we're trying to achieve here is dialogue. I want to stress this and I want to be crystal clear on this. We do not support uh, the creation of new uh, international uh, organization structures uh, for the governance of the internet. We do believe that we need to have a better understanding of who does what on the international stage and we might identify that there are certain organizations which deal with the global governance of the internet that might perform better. So this, in a nutshell, is our approach to internet governance. Uh, thank you again for the patience, and uh, we'll be happy to engage in discussion and take other questions. Thank you so much um, for that introduction. I, I'll keep the quote. To put it diplomatically, that's useless. I like it. I think that's good. If that's how diplomacy sounds, we're moving uh, along. Let me introduce um, Dixie Houghton now. She uh, has a background in human rights, and she works as a project manager for freedom of expression and digital communications at Global Partners in London. Uh, she's also worked uh, a lot with building capacity and networks also in the Global South, and she's managing two projects to work with civil society to effectively defend and strengthen internet freedoms, and she's doing a research project exploring potential policy solutions to global privacy protection on the internet. So uh, a lot of experience and um, has worked hard on the draft paper, so we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by kind of explaining why uh, we've written the paper. Um, at Global Partners and Associates, one of the things that we've been thinking of quite a lot about lately is the fact that there is a massive conversation going on, uh, sorry, well, it's not massive, unfortunately, but there is a really massively important conversation going on about how the internet is governed. And it is very important because obviously 
that's going to have a shape on the an effect on the shape of the internet which is central to all areas now of human life but that important discussion seems to be happening only among quite small groups um, and certainly doesn't have wider public attention when it because it's quite a dry topic when it does seem to attract a wider attention it's largely because people use very polemical terms um, which is also dangerous because you can politicize the conversation and, and prevent us from coming to kind of responsible and proper decisions. So this paper is trying to lay out the issues as objectively as possible to inspire new people uh, to engage in a considered debate around how the internet is governed. And as part of this process, we're also organizing civil society events in Kenya and Brazil later this year. Um, so, I think the first kind of question that you need to come to is why is the way the internet is governed at a global level important from a user perspective? For most users at present, the main direct threats that they have to human rights and to their free flow of information don't come from the global level. They come from either from national governments who take legal and well, national and regional governments who take legal and technical measures either alone or together, and also from the large and in many ways unaccountable power of, of the main internet companies. Um, but the global level governance is still very important because it creates the environment with which those, with, with which all of those threats come through. And the shape of that environment is going to affect both our ability to deal with those threats and also if it changes, the actual nature of the threats are likely to change as well. So what is the system that we have at the moment? It's dispersed, it's multi-stakeholder, it's complex, um, it involves a wide range of institutions and actors uh, who are all responsible for processes across different geographical, technical and social dimensions. When looking at the internet go governance regime, it's useful to divide it into two se sections which do overlap to one extent. But one is technical governance, which is what keeps the internet working. And the second is policy governance, which is about what happens once we're on the internet and how the overall internet ecosystem develops. Uh, with technical governance, it's mainly, it's mainly carried out by non-profit, membership-based, multi-stakeholder standard-setting bodies. And these are fairly open and they make decisions by rough consensus, examples being the IETF and ICANN. The general consensus is that the technical governance of the internet actually works very well. And where discussions about changing that seem to focus on is whether there might be some need for uh, international oversight of it and what that would look like in practice. That seems to be the main discussion point around uh, technical governance. On the policy side, it's much, much more complex. Um, there's obviously a large number of institutions who govern various aspects down from national governments to, I mean, even the European Union institutions, we've got WIPO, the WTO, the OECD, Council of Europe, and many, many more. And where these come together at the global level was uh, one of the main issues discussed at the World Summit on the Information Society. And out of that came two mechanisms. Of course, there's the Internet Governance Forum, which is a global multi-stakeholder forum for policy dialogue, so it's not decision-making. And the other was an agreement to move towards a process of enhanced cooperation. Um, this was much less clear what that meant in practice, and that's something that's still being discussed and debated today and is one of the kind of areas where changes to the internet governance uh, regime might come through. So that's where we've got to so far. And throughout, all, throughout that whole process, there have been many people calling for, for changes and improvements. And so that, this isn't new, but it's something that's, that's not actually going away and may, effect, in fact, be um, intensifying. Um, I like to think of it as divided, as, 
as there being kind of two different approaches. And the first, I would say, is the evolutionary change approach. And that's groups and people who think that the basics of the current governance system are right. When we're on a good path, there are some things that need to be worked out, but we need to work it out on a kind of topic by topic or or issue by issue basis. So we, yes, it needs to be more effective. Yes, it needs to be more accountable. Yes, there needs to be better representation, but we can do that generally with what we have already. The second approach um, is the revolutionary approach, which um, I'd say there's three arguments driving this, this approach, and it's, it's the approach calling for much bigger changes. The first is around effectiveness, and this is the, the fact that there are genuine issues like, for example, privacy protection, which under the current system it's actually quite difficult to deal with. And so people argue on that, with that argument either that we can do it through an evolutionary approach, but there are also others who say actually we need a revolutionary approach and we need some major changes. The second big argument pushing uh, the idea of having some revolutionary change is the idea that the current system perhaps has a democracy deficit, that actually it is developed countries and businesses who in reality are able to, um, who are actually in, in reality governing the environment and that de developed countries are getting together in forums like the OECD to make rules where, and this is actually a, a problem democratically for other countries and other stakeholders who are impacted by decisions that they don't have a role in, in uh, producing. The third argument, which I'd say pushes some of these calls for revolution, um, isn't usually said outrightly, but this is about greater control for illegitimate reasons. So we're seeing certainly certain countries who I won't name now who are calling for big revolutionary changes and it's questioned whether some of that is actually about political control. So what's actually on the table? Um, actually there are very few clearly labeled alternative systems being pro proposed. Actually, what tends to happen is that there are a number of proposals about other issues in different forms which could, in practice, have a significant effect on the overall governance regime. Uh, one exception to this is uh, the Indian proposal for a committee on internet rights, uh, internet related policies, I think, uh, which is a proposal for a separate body within the UN which would have oversight of the technical governance of the internet, would also develop and establish internet, international public policies. And it would have other stakeholders present within it, but it would uh, have the decisions would be made by governments. Another example of one of the proposals on the table is uh, Russia, China, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, who have put forward a proposal to the General Assembly for an international code of conduct for the information society, which is basically asking for UN level action on the issue of cybersecurity. And the third example, which I'm not going to go into too much now because that's what's going to be talked in the second panel, but is uh, the number of proposals being put forward at the ITU, which, as I understand it, are, pot would potentially move towards a more interventionist and regulatory approach towards the internet. So when you're looking at these different proposals and the changes that they could have to the internet uh, governance regime, I'd say there are three key sticking points. The first is about who has the power. Um, that's who has the power at the moment and who would have the power if, if things changed. And that's both in terms of different countries, but that's also in terms of different stakeholder groups. The second key sticking point, I think, is around dispersed versus centralized governance um, and what are the benefits and uh, disadvantages of these. And the third sticking point that jumps out at me is the question about 
in which institutions governance should take place, or more specifically, how those institutions work and how transparent or open they are. In fact, much of the criticism about the IETU is to do with the fact that its processes are relatively very closed. Um, so today's discussion is about the ITU, but I thought it was important to start by framing it within a, the fact that these proposals aren't something uh, isolated. They're actually part of a much larger constitutional constitutional type discussion about how the internet is governed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that opens up uh, with a great frame for our discussions. What is the EU doing on a number of issues? Is it enough? Is it effective, inclusive? How should we proceed in an evolutionary or revolutionary way? Uh, should there be intervention or regulation? or um, should everything just kind of develop in an organic way? So um, let me see who would like to ask first questions. See some colleagues here. I know some have to leave soon. No questions? I find that hard to believe. Yeah, Reagan. Hi. Um, I actually have a question for Andrea, and, and first, I share your pain <laughs> for being always assumed to be a woman. As My name is Reagan McDonald, and everyone always thinks I'm a man, so <laughs> I get a lot of emails, Dear Mr. McDonald. Anyway, <laughs> I'm clearly a, not a man. Um, I actually had a question for you on the Commission's position on the particular um, discussion in the ITU. Uh, I know because it's the review of the ITRs, there's quite a bit of proposals being put forward. And it's not always strictly divided on, you know, Russia, China, and then developing countries, but even within Europe, there's some different views. And I wonder if the Commission has a plan to have a, a united stance on this, or whether or not it has, it has been reaching out to particular member states, um, and if it will be responding to this potential threat to internet governance on a European level. We'll do a couple of questions and then uh, answers. Um, yeah, let me just take these two gentlemen in the front and then we'll go back to the panel. First, the uh, gentleman in the purple shirt and then uh, Larry Stone. Thank you, Deputy Schake. I'm not sure that was correctly pronounced. I hope so. I'm very interested in uh, hearing uh, the analysis of different stakeholders and how they would like to regulate the internet, which after all is a communications medium. What I'm slightly missing from this analysis is the extent to which the internet would let itself be regulated. There's certainly no shortage of people who are offended by other people discussing certain topics, or the fact that they can even question the dogma in um, some other countries in the world. And if it's something I observed on the internet, it is that the only reason it is being governed by technical institutions at the moment is that the internet as a living organism is letting itself be governed by those institutions. It has come to trust those institutions and learn that the internet, they tend to work for the optimum function, function of this communications medium. This cannot be said of a lot of the institutions that desire control over this communications medium. In particular, in uh, less, democratic, uh, less democratic places, but also, unfortunately, in several democratic countries. So I'd like to add that question to, to the discussion here. To what extent do we believe that the internet will let itself be regulated? And if these stakeholders that agree to regulate it in certain terms, if and when they fail to do so because of a lack of consent of the governed, what would happen next? So basically, does the internet get the government it deserves? 
Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll take one more question and then we'll go back to answers. Yeah, sorry, there's a big, bit of a buzz, but I can't help it. I think it's in our system. Uh, hi, it's Larry Stone from, uh, from BT. On the, uh, to continue the transgender theme, um, my name is actually Laurence, or Lawrence in, uh, in English. It's caused me enormous problems in France, actually, that's, uh, if that helps. Um, <laughs> um, no, but I was very taken by the, that, by the, uh, that, by the analysis um, and by global, global partners because um, if you look at the internet, there are a number of policy areas that one can uh, analyze, whether it's technical, security, antitrust, regulatory and commercial, how traffic now moves uh, around the world and how uh, there's an exponential growth uh, uh, in traffic, you know, privacy, piracy, child protection, crime, human rights. And now, looking at each of those, not that I intend to in this intervention, um, uh, determines a different analysis. It seems to me at the, te at the technical level, you naturally need a supranational global dialogue because you want interconnectivity, and interconnectivity and technical uh, standardization leads to openness. On other areas, which is where we part from, for example, the ethno view uh, on the commercial view on ITRs, um, the last thing you need is a supranational approach to um, some form of regulation of commercial uh, uh, traffic. Could you um, try to explain internet. that a little bit more for the people who don't immediately know what you're talking about? I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, um, there's a uh, suggestion um, uh, by Aetna, which is the uh, uh, European Telecoms Network Operators Association. And, and I mean, it's a very good organization, and we support a number of uh, its positions, though we're not a member, for example, on data protection. What it's suggested is uh, a number of changes to the preamble um, to uh, part of the international telecommunications regulations which come up for review towards the end of this year uh, to, as, as they see it, um, future-proof uh, uh, the ITRs from a proposal which was around passing of telephony traffic from 19, 19, 1988 about how telephony passed for correspondent services between effectively publicly owned administrations to um, how traffic now goes around the world um, uh, on the internet in a sort of a, a much more multi-stakeholder, multi-operator environment. Um, and it strikes us that uh, uh, what the approach that's needed is a, uh, is a more complex uh, approach to how the internet is uh, regulated and governed, um, rather than uh, trying to find some form of uh, panacea for handling commercial uh, activities at the global level. I mean, that's my, my take. And my view on, on the latter is that you, what you need basically is the, the market to work it out uh, itself in terms of commercial agreements, and where it can't, there are perfectly adequate regulatory and antitrust proceedings at, at the national or, for example, EU level. So that's that's the sort of. Um, uh, so I haven't asked a question, have I? Um, but um, it just strikes me we need the analysis against the different sorts of issues, and some things are naturally percolate towards supranational, international, technical, and other things we should uh, uh, leave as well alone as possible. All right, that's clear. So the question in the back is related to what we're discussing now, or is it a new question? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I would like to expand, actually, on Mr. Falkwinger's comment, uh, whether the Internet um, allows itself to be regulated. I would like even to reverse the question, whether it makes sense to let policy regulate the technical domain and not the other way around, because I think the governments that we see, for example, in the technical domain regarding the Internet is, I think, much more democratic and novel that actually we should try to reverse this whole trend and try to apply these models to, policy uh, to the policy domain, uh, because I feel what we are discussing now, that policy wants to regulate the Internet, whatever that means, and whether it allows itself to be regulated, is not really the question, but it should be returned whether we can actually apply these models to old school traditional governance models and, and make governance actually uh, based on what we um, experience on the internet tonight. All right, that's a clear question and I think we'll, we'll touch upon that. Um, but it might be good to keep in mind in relation to the last question that there's many players uh, with a government role and um, sometimes if one of them starts, let's say, <laughs> uh, to use certain platforms, the question is do you have to act in response or should you just let it go? In other words, um, it probably has some relation to geography, you know, uh, can internet be regulated or not? But let's see what um, Andrea has to say. Do you want to start answering? Yeah, go ahead. 
Thank you. And by the way, thank you for the most interesting questions. They're very hard questions, so I'll do my best, perhaps not to answer them, but uh, at least to contribute to the discussion. Uh, I will start from the last question because, in fact, it's uh, the, perhaps the most complicated for me to answer properly, and I don't want to forget my answer as I answered the other ones. So I will start from the last one. Uh, I think we need to be to be a bit clearer on what we mean when we say that policy regulates the technology or technology regulates the policy. So on one, on one level, uh, uh, we, we, we do not and we will not accept the notion that technology and only technology determines uh, what we believe uh, is right or wrong. We do have systems in place uh, which are, have all the limits that you want, but we have systems in place to try and decide as a community, as the European, uh, the EU, the European Union at the national level, what we believe is a right law, is a wrong law, etc. Uh, I'm not sure this is what you are saying, so don't take this as a personal uh, reaction. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that simply saying, well, technology does not allow this particular law to be applied, so we should forget about the law. It's a consideration to be taken into account, because, of course, if doing laws that cannot possibly be applied is not a good, uh, a good way of uh, legislating. But we cannot accept this notion. Frankly, saying that, well, whatever technology comes, comes up with, uh, we will accept it, uh, is a kind of moral defeat, is a societal defeat. Because if you, let's not talk about the internet, let's talk about nuclear power. With the same reasoning we could say, well, we could have said years ago, well, we have nuclear power, we have nuclear weapons, we will never be able to do anything about this, so let's just uh, obliterate each other. Because that's what technology allows us to do. No, we found, we found ways which are perfectible, but we found ways to regulate technology. What I think uh, your point, what I suspect your point was more about was about the manners, the ways in which uh, decision making uh, or policy development uh, uh, takes place in what you call the policy community and in the technical community. From that point of view, I personally think that the, the policy community, including the EU policy community, including the European Commission, could learn a lot from the policy development processes of the, for example, the Internet Engineering Task Force, even some, some policy development processes of ICANN, not many, to be honest, but some of them. I do also believe that some of those communities may learn a thing or two from the way in which we have learned, uh, not only in the EU, but at the national level, to handle with very complex issues, such as how do you ensure that all voices are heard? You know, it's funny, and then I will pass with their questions, because otherwise I will occupy all the time. But if you look at one of the many ITF documents that describe uh, how the Internet Engineering Task Force works, uh, in the definition of rough consensus, uh, which is one of the tenets of the ITF, you know, rough consensus and running code are what makes uh, a specification become, uh, sorry, a proposal become a specification. And then you discover that actually one of the ways in which you can demonstrate rough consensus is by humming. So that an ITF meeting, you have people that literally will say, mm, and that's supposed to mean that you agree with the proposal. Is this a proper way to accept? I'm not inventing this. You can find it in the ITF documents. It's the, the Tau of the ITF. You can see it there. Is this a proper way to do policy development? I have my doubts. So what I'm trying to say is that perhaps there should be a bidirectional exchange of views. on, And we should learn uh, what each side has learned to do best in its long or not so long uh, life. Uh, to, to answer to, to Miss McDonald's uh, uh, question concerning the wicket and the EU position, yes, the, the EU is coordinating its positions. Uh, Europe, in a very broad sense, is also coordinating its position in the CPT, which, as you know, is the Conference of European Post and Telecommunication Operators and Telegraph Operators, which, as the name suggests, is a very old uh, entity. Uh, the challenge with the CPT, uh, which is one of the regional organizations through which uh, ITU member states get to a consensus on their respective position before they get to the ITU. So you have the same in Africa, you have them in the Asia Pacific region, and you have the CPT. The CPT is uh, larger in the European Union, it includes uh, countries such as Turkey and Russia on which on these particular issues we don't necessarily see eye to eye. So uh, we, all, we also have coordination at the EU level. And uh, quite frankly, on the wiki, I know this will be a topic for the second, second part of the conversation, so I don't want to spend uh, now too much time on it. Uh, until now, there have been a lot of proposals flying around. 
many, many proposals, some of which, frankly, uh, I think they have been put on the table just to see if, uh, how people would react. And we will need to see what actually comes out uh, of the next Council Working Group meeting, which is going to take place, uh, actually, I think, started today. And then we will see what are the really the proposals on the table. Uh, and then if I may, for two minutes, uh, because Mr. Falvinga, I think is the correct pronunciation, uh, I read your blog, by the way, it's a very interesting blog. Uh, you raise an extremely important point, which is the consent of the governor. Uh, you know better than me that there has been a recent book, I think, by Rebecca McKinnon about the consent of the networked. Uh, I think that we have to approach, I, we can't solve that issue now, we have to keep it very firmly in our head that uh, any kind of top-down regulation that doesn't meet what are the social uh, expectations and uh, uh, understandings of the population that you are supposed to, to, you don't regulate the population, but unavoidably you do regulation that impact on the population. So if you don't understand what are the social expectations, you are going to do regulation that doesn't make any sense. Now, if, I'm, if I am allowed to quote uh, my direct boss, which is always good for my promotion, and I hope this is recorded, <laughs> Vice President Cruz uh, uh, said as much in a speech, which unfortunately was not, I, I didn't see it uh, being very widely shared amongst the activist community. It was at the Forum d'Avignon on copyright. Uh, and what she basically said was that current copyright enforcement is not working. And the reason why it's not working is because people don't see the point. So we need to find other solutions. Now, this is one voice within the European Commission. Uh, I think everybody is aware that there are other voices within the European Commission. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to get at here is that, yes, we are very sensitive to the notion that you can't impose uh, uh, regulation that don't make sense, uh, that people will not accept. On the other hand, we also have to be clear on one point, and this is quite important for us. Uh, the internet is not, uh, in our view at least, uh, is not uh, a parallel world is not something that exists outside society. What is legal or illegal in our jurisdictions is legal or illegal online. Now, the real question is whether you can still apply the same jurisdictional mechanism that you, we managed to apply in the Union, in the European Union. You can apply them online. That's a fascinating and quite complex question. And second, whether the methods of enforcement of those laws need to stay the same, can stay the same. But that's a question of process. It's not a question of substance. So I hope that's even if not answering, at least contributes to the, to the point that you have raised. Thank you. Just two quick comments. Um, one about the extent to which the internet would let itself be regulated, which is a very good question, of course. Um, I would say that, that I think people are empowered and people will. Um, <laughs> it is an issue that is close to a lot of citizens across the world, which is why you see massive um, protests on things like ATCA, which is I mean, quite unprecedented for a copyright treaty. Um, whether it can be regulated, I'd say not to rest on our laurels, just because plenty of governments, like China, for example, have found pretty effective ways, and I think I'm not saying every country would take a, a Chinese approach, but there are ways to do it if they wanted to and they were ready to go that far. Um, and so I'd just say we should be conscious of it. And um, the other question from the fellow from BT, I just want to be clear that I'm not arguing in the paper for a, a supranational level of governance. That's, it's a discussion paper, so it's meant to highlight uh, the different arguments that people are making, but I would say where it might have come across that I was arguing that is that I do think that there are some genuine, genuine issues, like for example, um, consumer privacy protection, which are actually very hard to deal with in the current system, so that we need to look at what methods are available to us. But I wouldn't jump straight in and say we need a supranational level of governance. I think we need to be much more creative thinking about how we can do things like that. All right. Joe, go ahead. For, just for the people who don't know who Joe is, uh, he's the EU advocacy, advocacy coordinator at uh, European Digital Rights. So go ahead. Thank you. Um, I've got loads of things I'd like to say about mm -hmm. self-regulation and the European Commission's approach to self-regulation or what it understands by self-regulation. 
uh, because it understands a lot of things that are almost completely unrelated to each other by the same by the same term. But I just wanted to bring up um, the issue of that, that Rick raised uh, on um, letting yourself be be governed or um, or managed. There are certain things that are that happen through so-called self-regulation, uh, which would never happen through a democratic decision-making process, and there. Things that happen completely non-transparently, um, and the um, your home country gives a, uh, a good example. For the last uh, six or seven years, there is a um, an internet blocking system uh, in Sweden. Um, this is voluntary. Uh, there was no government decision. There was no public debate. Um, Nobody knew whether there was a particular problem it was trying to solve. So we start off with a policy that's got very weak foundations. Um, but nobody's looking. It's, it's done in the private sector. Um, there was a presentation by the Swedish police that I heard uh, a few months ago, uh, and they explained that the, uh, the list of uh, sites that are blocked is updated every two weeks approximately, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, according to the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK, uh, the average uh, lifetime of one of these sites uh, that is being blocked is 12 days. Um, the whole system is absurd. Um, yes, uh, Swedish people allow themselves to be, to be regulated by their uh, telcos in this way. Um, so they are letting themselves be regulated. Uh, because it's self-regulation, there's, no, uh, there's no democratic control, there's no discussion. Uh, it's, a, it's a sheer absurdity, and it's worse than useless because it means that uh, the Swedish police actively go around lobbying for their solution around the rest of the world, um, preventing real actions from being taken against real problems. And, uh, uh, that's one example of, of self-regulation. Firstly, not being self-regulation because the companies aren't regulating themselves. And secondly, it being useless, absurd, and counterproductive. All right. I think uh, you'll have, I hope you'll have a, <clears throat> a great chance to also share your broader views on this um, uh, afterwards. I'm triggered to thinking about what you said about you know, how self-regulatory proposals would have never happened through democratic decision-making. And so that does suggest that some sort of democratic process uh, may improve the outcomes, uh, even when it comes to decisions about the Internet. But again, uh, raises questions about legit the legitimacy of measures taken at all uh, and the authority of those who can influence the Internet or parts of it uh, and, and on democratic oversight. Do you want to ask a question? Thank you, Marietje. Um, Member of the European Parliament, um, if I understand well this first round, then we have to answer once more the question you just raised. Is the Internet a technology or is it a structure? So meaning, can we govern, as you have compared it with the nuclear technologies and the atom H-bombs, etc., uh, that we found a way? So I, I would say uh, we can't uh, create the governance of the technologies because we can only organize the governance about the access, the possession, etc., of the technologies. So that leads to the question, uh, shouldn't we think about the Internet as an existing structure and we have to introduce self-democratized uh, um, democratic self-regulations, maybe better a wording, of this structure. So that we're not coming into the possession that we are saying that one authority, like the European Commission or the European Union or China or somebody else, is authorized to, to govern this structure, but in the way that we have the self-regulations of a democratic possession, excluding what you said about the children, about uh, others, that they don't get harm from this structure in their uh, development. In this way, I would uh, reorientate the debate. 
Thanks. I think we're just going to take that on board. Or do, is there anyone? Did you want to answer urgently? Go ahead. Just uh, perhaps unnecessary, but for the record, a point of clarification that the Commission uh, does not at all believe that one single uh, organization, one single entity can or should govern the Internet, but even more importantly, they can govern the Internet. The point I was making, which I reiterate, is that there are areas in which we, it's not only the European Commission, I mean, we may power hungry, but as a public authority, we also have responsibilities, as all power public authorities are. Let's not forget that we are at the service of European citizens, and we have obligations towards European citizens to enforce laws. So the point I was trying to make is that there are situations uh, in which we do not even have the option <laughs> to decide whether to intervene or not. If we see that there are massive, uh, uh, that's perhaps not a good example because it's up to the national, uh, to, to, to national, to the member states. But if we see there are massive privacy or data violations, uh, sorry, privacy or personal data violations uh, committed by internet companies. As the Commission within our power, or as a member state, or as a data protection authority, do we have the option to say, well, we don't do anything because we don't want to touch the Internet? No, we don't have that option. Now, the question is to create a governance structure in which we can, A, prevent these massive issues from happening, and B, if we have to intervene, that we can intervene in a sensible manner, in an effective manner, without too many side effects. And to be clear, I register uh, Edris' criticism on our approach to self-regulation, which are not new, but they're always welcome to refresh our memory in case we forget uh, the, the points raised. Uh, this is, even in terms of how to do policy, this is quite frankly quite a new environment. And we are all learning in here. And if you look at the position that the Commission took uh, 10 years ago, or it took today, the basic principles remain the same, but we do change our approach because we also learn from, of course, the Commission never commits mistakes, but we, we learn from the things that we might uh, do better. So from this point of view, we welcome the dialogue. But again, to be clear, we don't want a single uh, overarching top-down uh, regulation of the Internet, just to be absolutely clear. All right, I think with that we're going to give the floor to the next panel. There will be plenty of opportunity to ask questions to all the panelists later, but perhaps some of the interventions will also complete the picture and answer some of the questions you may have now. Uh, for that, we'll start with uh, Dr. William Drake, who is an international fellow and lecturer at the <coughs> Institute of Mass Communication and Media Research at the University of Zurich. He's also a consultant based in Geneva. Uh, he's been heavily involved in global internet governance debates and processes over the years, and he's currently a member of the GNSO Council and the Eurelo Board of Directors in ICANN, the multi-stakeholder advisory group of the Internet Governance Forum, the Civil Society Information Society Advisory Board of the OECD, and the core faculty of the European and, uh, and South Schools on Internet Governance. Well. It sounds like <laughs> like a great uh, great addition to our afternoon. Please please share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, it's very interesting, I think, to be in this particular context because uh, I've been watching very closely the raging debates going on in the United States around the uh, upcoming World Conference in International Telecommunication, and I haven't had a very strong sense of what the, the character of the discussion is in Europe, although I live in Europe, I haven't seen the issue percolating in quite the same way in the media and in other environments. So if the European Parliament is looking to get involved in this space, I think that would be a very healthy and very useful thing, um, and I'm happy to be able to contribute to that however I can. Um, Anybody who's been paying attention to the sort of uh, online discussions around this will know that in uh, recent uh, weeks there's been an enormous amount of energy uh, expended in the blogosphere and elsewhere around the notion of the wicket and whether or not the wicket negotiations uh, were essentially going to lead to the, quote, UN taking over the Internet and so on. And there's been a lot of discussion and uh, pontificating, not all of which has been terribly well directed or informed, uh, and some of which seems to really be driven by various political agendas and so on. So I think it's good to step back and try and really look at what are we really talking about in terms of the, the proposals and the dynamics that are taking place here. 
Um, the, it isn't, in fact, the case that uh, the United Nations is going to send black helicopters to take over the Internet. Uh, the the, uh, the root zone file will not suddenly go into the pocket of the UN Secretary General and so on and so forth. That's not what this is. But what this is is that you've got an international organization, the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, that has 190-something member governments, uh, many of whom have historically had government-run uh, telecommunication systems that have privatized those systems or liberalized them to varying degrees in recent decades, um, and that in the context of the whole kind of global liberalization of telecommunications markets and the rise of the internet, has seen many member uh, governments' concerns, and particularly the positions of their dominant national telecommunications carriers' concerns, kind of being losing some of their force. And so this is an effort, in a way, to try to recapture ground. It is, in particular, an effort by uh, telecom companies in many uh, parts of the world to leverage a multilateral institution to recover market shares that they had lost in the face of liberalization. And the battles that we're having over the wicket now are very much similar in a lot of ways to the battles that happened uh, 24 years ago the last time the international telecommunications regulations were revised in a negotiation that was called WATSI 88, the World Administrative Telegraph and Telephone uh, Conference of 1988, which produced this document. This is what all the fuss is about. It's less than 30 pages. Uh, it has only 10 articles in it. It's a very minimalist document. But this document is actually quite interesting in his historical context because what it does is it embodies a set of principles that have shaped the diplomacy of global telecommunications since the 1850s. And the fundamental kind of concept that was the glue, the political glue of the international telephone system and before that the telegraph system, which was that essentially all member governments had strong sovereign control over their national networks and international services would necessarily involve cooperation between them. You couldn't have services being provided into your uh, territory by entities in another country without your permission. You had to work out a cooperative agreement between the two. And you had to work out a way to, do, to split up the revenue. It was all based on interconnecting national networks and revenue sharing and devising mechanisms for revenue sharing. That system was preserved for a century and a half, in effect. But now, because of liberalization and so on, the revenues that were historically generated from that have declined. And so we get this big push to use the UN to try to recapture territory. In 1988, a lot of the battle was over what would be regulated and who would be regulated. Today, the battle is again about what would be regulated and who would be regulated. Um, and in that context, because this is providing this wonderful opportunity for these countries to revisit these issues, many other kinds of issues are being added into the pot, cybersecurity, censorship, and so on. So you have now this kind of dynamic where many countries, over an extended period of negotiation, are throwing in their pet projects, their pet desires, to see what will stick in the process of the negotiations. Now, at the end of the day, ultimately, governments can take reservations to what is agreed in the international telecommunication regulations. And in fact, if you look at this document, about half the book is actually the reservations that various governments have put on their interpretations of the obligations here. And very often, those reservations are quite sweeping. They'll say things like, my government does not understand anything in this document to mean such and such, and therefore I won't do X or Y. And I reserve my right to do whatever I want in the future. <laughs> so because of that, some people have said, well, we really shouldn't worry about this too much because if countries put forward a lot of really pro-regulatory kinds of bad ideas that will harm the Internet, the, the U.S., Europe, and other kind of pro-Internet countries will simply take a lot of reservations, and that will diminish the scope of it. The problem is that even if that happens, 
you still have the possibility that at the national level and in bilateral relations, a number of countries and regions could insist on a strict interpretation of particular provisions that would have a restrictive impact on the internet and which in the aggregate would, could reduce the overall interoperability and effectiveness and efficiency of the internet, in essentially creating new kinds of cyber balkanization around different types of issue spaces and could lead indeed to higher costs for businesses and so on. So there are risks here and we can't be sanguine about it. We can't say, well, the reservations mean that we will have a way out. Every effort should be expended to try to ensure that the, uh, the provisions that are agreed really do not lend themselves to an expansive interpretation um, that the internet should be heavily regulated along with traditional telecommunications. And let me just give you a few examples, because I know I shouldn't talk too long, but just to give you a flavor of some of the, the things that are on the table. For example, when I mentioned the notion of who is covered by the international telecommunications regulations, historically they applied to administrations, the national PTTs and later public telecom operators that were the primary dominant players within countries. And then you had recognized private operators that were subject to very specific kinds of obligations. There was a whole broader domain of operators that were not really regulated under this, these terms and who could take advantage of what were called special arrangements to form commercial relationships to organize global markets and terminate traffic for more specialized high-end services. What's being proposed now is essentially to apply this to all kinds of operators so that essentially anybody who's engaged in provisioning international communication services would be subject to the international telecommunications regulations. And that, depending on some other things that could happen, could include internet service providers um, and everybody involved in providing internet. There are proposals to extend, um, strengthen the impact uh, of national laws uh, and make them essentially um, embody international regulatory provisions in domestic laws and make them mandatory. So essentially bind members to have to follow a very rigid set of rules, which they do not now. And as far as what's covered, well, there are proposals to expand just the, the definition of the ITU's ambit to include all information and communication technology. But there's also a number of more specific, you really have to read all these provisions that people put forward because they're quite clever in the, the wordplay often. You, you, you get uh, language about internet uh, termination services and so on. When you read the whole thing together, you realize that essentially what is being proposed in a number of these amendments is that everybody involved in providing internet services would be subject. And, you know, and it, there's language about hubbing and different type IXPs and all these different types of elements of the architecture of, of organizing global markets. But essentially the notion is that we would apply these intergovernmental rules across the board to everybody. And this is highly problematic. Then there's uh, provisions about cybersecurity that the Russians in particular want to push, which could be interpreted in a way that would really reinforce state surveillance and power in some important respects. There are proposals to make all of the technical standards that historically have been voluntary, mandatory, to essentially make ITU standards mandatory and indeed uh, have them transferred into national laws and policies. Um, there's proposals, I mean, some of this really gets kind of out there. Uh, there are proposals to uh, establish new international rules on fraud that define any kind of use of number resources as fraud subject to the rules. And when they talk about number resources, first, at first blush you think, well, this only means telephone numbers. But if you read that provision against some of the other provisions, which would expand the ambit of the agreements, it could potentially include the numbers that are used in the internet. So again, uh, you have some problems. You've got a desire to essentially take the whole kind of traditional mechanism of uh, having co companies link together their net networks and make payments to each other 
to compensate each other for traffic flows, which is what traditionally was done in telephone services before the world of liberalization really set in, and apply that kind of model into the internet environment. And what's particularly disturbing, I think, in a way, is that one of the principal proponents uh, for doing some kind of restrictions in this regard uh, are the European telecommunications operators. Um, and which is something that I think we'll be having a discussion about this tomorrow in another workshop uh, that they will be attending. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the, the arguments for it. But nevertheless, the notion that you would take what you have now on the internet, the way networks are, are interconnected and peered and with a, a certain amount of payments and special conditions, but generally speaking, it's not all based on a big bureaucratic administrative process of settling accounts and making payments back and forth. And subject that to the kind of accounting and settlement types processes, which we've essentially done away with in telephone services in the context of liberalization, is really quite remarkable. I mean, I understand the concerns that the carriers are expressing about their financial positions and the fact that uh, all internet, international telecommunications is increasingly moving to being IP-based networks. And so that, that they are looking at their revenue streams and they're looking at ways to recover their costs. And they're saying there should be burden sharing and equitable compensation and so on. And you understand the thinking. But the question is, do you want to do that through a multilateral international treaty with 190 governments? And finally, and because I know I should stop, I just want to bring your attention to one particular um, and to me highly uh, problematic provision. And I don't think it will ultimately stay in the agreement, but I think nevertheless it's the kind of thing that really reveals what this political moment is about. China has proposed a, the addition of a provision on the role of national governments in the oversight of networks and security uh, within their national domain, within their national spaces. That says member states have the responsibility and right to protect the network security of the information and communication infrastructure within their state their state, and to promote the international cooperation, SIC, to fight against ne network attacks and disruptions. Member states have the responsibility to require and supervise that enterprises operating in their territory use ICTs in a rational way and endeavor to ensure the effective functioning of ICTs in secure and trustworthy conditions. So this is the Chinese government asking for an international treaty agreement that essentially says states have broad supervisory control over the use of information and communication technology um, and all enterprises that employ it. Now, obviously that, you know, this is, some, this is asking for reservations if the text were to stay in, but the point is you're getting these kinds of agendas being added into the mix. So this is a very important time that the negotiation happens in March. In the run-up until that point, there's been a lot of effort to try to mobilize people who want to preserve an open and free internet. And I certainly hope that you know Europe and the European Parliament in particular will be part of that effort. Thank you. Um, we're trying our best, and today is one of those efforts. And um, uh, we're also going with the delegation to the IGF and. and I think it's uh, rising on our political agendas, but it certainly helps if you all remind members. Uh, I just want to see if we can push this a little bit further, because uh, just being devil's advocate, f when somebody proposes something that may seem um, dangerous or controversial or particular or even uh, unrealistic or strange, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to pass. So I just wanted to see if we can discuss the likeliness of some of these most, you know, risky or, or uh, limiting proposals to pass, and also to, to look at how legally binding some of these decisions really are. Um, and perhaps later in the discussion, but I'm saying this so that maybe the two other speakers can integrate this in their interventions, we can discuss the concept of extraterritoriality, uh, so lawmaking, uh, that has usually been tied to the uh, geography of a nation state. Constitutions, uh, citizenship, you know, have, have been the key uh, ingredients for 
determining jurisdiction of laws over certain individuals or entities or territories, and that is seriously challenged by the global nature of the Internet. On the other hand, um, I wanted to touch upon the sort of domino effect, so that if one country or one company or one entity uh, were to take a decision on either a technical or a commercial or a legal basis, uh, can it be confined to the territory of that entity, whether it's a company uh, for its services, let's say, or uh, a country for its uh, jurisdiction, or is it inevitably going to have a spillover effect and how do we deal with this? I mean, should there be some kind of body where arbitration takes place or uh, where users can uh, can claim their rights. Uh, these are, I think, kinds of things that we have to think about in a political context, because we should also remember, for as far as the uh, European Parliament can play a role, it will still be in the context of uh, policy and politics. Uh, we don't own companies, etc. We can only uh, hold them accountable and, and, you know, enforce rules that, that may exist uh, or try to change them. But I think it's important uh, to look at, at those aspects of lawmaking uh, as well. But anyway, um, sorry for that um, um, out loud thinking. Uh, I would like to introduce Marco Pancini now. He's uh, the open internet ev evangelist. Ah, okay, well, no, <laughs> he's Italian, so maybe that explains, uh, at Google. And before that, uh, he, uh, he worked at Google in Italy. Yes, probably it explains uh, my name, Marco, so <laughs> one of the four, but we don't have the, the other three one. We have Vint, which makes, uh, who makes uh, a little bit something more, even more important, the other three ones. So um, very humbly, not an uh, internet evangelist, but simply a policy council from the, the Brussels team. I will start uh, by challenging this idea that the internet service provider or in the internet world doesn't like regulation or any kind of regulation. Actually, we were amongst the one who proposed that were again, uh, again and again proposing to put and uh, the orders of the trade and negotiation internationally the free flow of information as uh, one important point. We know that is um, a little bit naive and ambitious and uh, experts say to us that uh, this is not uh, the kind of things that you discuss in trade agreements, but still uh, we uh, believe that uh, there are ways to improve uh, the respect of fundamental rights, the free flow of information, even through legislative measures. So legislation is not uh, evil per se. It depends. It depends on on the context. It depends on uh, on the proposal put on the table. This uh, this is um, a nook to, to to start discuss about uh, the the um, the ITR and the and all the proposal that was very very well um, uh, explained by by the previous um, panelists. Uh, I think we have uh, two kind of problem. One is a problem of process and one is a problem of substance. In terms of process, we are a strong believer in multi-stakeholderism. Uh, I don't need to mention uh, things that were, were already said. The power of uh, a multi-stakeholder platform for discussion around internet governance is uh, per se a value. It allows uh, to have also think to, to think about solution and proposal uh, coming out of the box, out of the, the, the classical uh, agenda, governmental agenda, and uh, it also mirrors the complexity of, of the internet. Uh, at the same time, it also debunk a little bit one of one of the big arguments that we are hearing in these days that you know some 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 uh, companies or some uh, stakeholders are adding, uh, are adding uh, behind the multi-stakeholderism. I think multi-stakeholderism per se uh, already gives the idea that uh, all the, the different subjects in, in the ecosystem, uh, in the internet ecosystem, wants to have a say, in industry included. So we, we clearly uh, are, are, are pushing for, for a governance uh, structure and method which allows us and the civil society to be part of the discussion and not leave this only to governments. And because, because uh, the, 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 the power of, of this model was clear, uh, it's clear under in, our, under in our eyes in terms of participation, in terms of open standards, in terms of, of, of um, participation of all the different stakeholders to the, to the decision making process. A substance. Uh, I think uh, some of the proposals that were described are strongly affecting fundamental rights. 
uh, it's clear uh, that uh, the aim of some of this proposal is to increase uh, oversight on internet content, reduce uh, uh, the, the, the space for, for, so for citizens to express themselves online mm -hmm. and to access to information. And this is crucial, especially if we believe, as we do, that one of the big, uh, um, the big advantages that the internet is bringing to societies is transparency. So the possibility to have oversight over, over government choices and government decision, um, which goes from, from the, the request to take down content from governments to, moreover, the, 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 the way regulation can be used in order to shape access to information from governments. But also, I will not, will not underestimate the impact of, from economic point of view of, of, of this proposal. If we take some of the proposal on the table, uh, tablet by, by the um, telcos, uh, you can see how the impact is for sure on the commercial uh, power of the different subject. So, I mean, they, for sure, they can leverage uh, this proposal in the commercial negotiation, especially if you have uh, um, UN agency regulating the, the, um, this, uh, this area. But let's think about the impact on uh, the famous two guys in the garage, on the small and medium enterprise who wants to use the internet to um, start uh, um, to start their activity to op to open up their activity to new to, to new markets. So again, it's not only a matter of uh, of uh, um, it's not only a matter of fundamental rights. Even if fundamental rights are still a big concern for us, it's also a matter of uh, the impact from economic point of view that uh, this uh, this proposal could have uh, not not only for big corporation but also for for whoever wants to use the internet. To, uh, to to start to start uh, its, its activity. All this said, I think uh, uh, we should avoid and uh, restrain from not uh, uh, to, for not uh, um, having a transparent and fair debate around the challenges that the internet governance uh, pose to all of us. Uh, I I really believe that, as Andrea said, that the inclusion in in the international in the discussion on the governance of the internet of more of, of the, the um, more representation from the regional forces is is necessary is necessary as well to uh, bring some of these uh, thinking at uh, all uh, in all the fora where internet governance is discussed from ICANN to the IGF uh, and and try to improve the, the governance and the effectiveness of this institution. We don't believe that the solution is a new, is a new agency. We don't believe that the solution is to bring to the geopolitical discussion on internet governance interest, uh, uh, commercial interest. Uh, we believe that for this we have, uh, we have um, the commercial relationship that are actually existing and, uh, and can be used. As, as far as we can believe that existing laws and existing decision making process are still uh, the place uh, to discuss one of the challenges that, uh, that Andrea has, has raised around the jurisdictional application of, of law to, um, to internet service provider. Okay. Thank you very much. Last but not least, uh, Joe McNamee, who works with a um, civil rights organization called EDRI, uh, with now 32 privacy and civil rights organizations uh, as members, so it's a growing, growing organization. Thank you very much. I um, looked at the list of speakers before I started writing my presentation and thought, what on earth am I going to have to say that hasn't been said brilliantly already by the time they come to me? Uh, and the answer is not a lot. I'd just like to pick up uh, a few points. Um, um, the first point is I think that a lot of the problem that we currently face with, uh, particularly with the ITU, is uh, our own fault. Uh, it's the fault of the EU and the US. Um, the ITU is a bureaucracy. It has hundreds of staff. Um, the move, as uh, Dr. Drake explained, uh, away from traditional telephony to um, IP-based telephony, uh, to, to IP-based communications, uh, means that they've got a lot less to do, and they need to find something to do. Um, they're 
to paraphrase uh, a wise person, old bureaucracies don't die, they file themselves in a different folder. And the folder is the internet, unfortunately. They've been floundering around for years, uh, spending money on um, conferences, on, on spam, on cybercrime, um, on promoting a technology called Enum. Now, Enum uh, you won't have heard of because there was no point in promoting it, uh, but it uses telephone numbers, and the, and the ITU is responsible for telephone numbers, so they promoted it. Um, it's an organization which is fundamentally unsuitable uh, to, um, for the regulation of, of the internet in any way. It's slow moving, it's closed, um, and its high corporate membership fees can only be seen as a way of selling influence in the organization. It's such a closed institution that it's not even possible for citizens to gain access to their documents without paying for them. Um, now, one of the reasons that the ITU hasn't been able previously to branch into uh, the internet is because um, the United States, up until quite recently, has behaved in an exemplary way with regard to what is under its control. Um, it, it has acted with reserve, with self-control, and with wisdom. Um, and because of the way the uh, US has acted in the last 20 years, up until recently, um, we've all benefited, and we shouldn't forget that. The problem is that things aren't the same now as they were 10 or 15 years ago with the US. Um, the US, supported by the EU, has started to look rapaciously at the critical infrastructure it controls, and what it can use um, to further its own interests. And one example of this is Section 104 of SOPA, which I think is the, the center of all, of all um, wisdom in terms of what's, what's wrong with uh, the Western world's current view of the internet. Section 104 of SOPA granted US companies complete liability protection for vigilante policing of the internet. It said that any service provider, any payment network provider, any internet advertising service, any advertiser, any internet search engine, any domain name registry, any domain name registrar, taking action against a foreign site would have complete protection under, under the US courts, as long as they had reasonable belief that they were acting against a, a, uh, a site that was acting against US interests. Now, we need to think about this a minute. The world's leading democracy, a democracy with a strong constitution, a democracy support that supports the rule of law, proposed this. It proposed granting private companies open-ended powers to annihilate online resources around the world if they reasonably believed that the foreign company was breaching US law. And they did this in the knowledge that, according to, to Google in 2009, 37% of complaints under the DM, US DMCA were motivated by anti-competitive -com uh, motivations. So what's the EU, EU being doing, doing about this? What's the EU's reaction to extraterritorial, non-judicial, non-rule of law land grabs by the United States? Well, the European Commission says that we should ratify ACTA. We believe, we Europeans believe, that the United States should be under a positive obligation to encourage companies under its jurisdiction to become online sheriffs undermining our legal certainty, our freedom of communication, and our rule of law. If you're a country from the global south, if it, in fact, if you're, if you're either from the legitimate side or the illegitimate side in, uh, in the ITU, you've, this, is, this is the reason you, you, you have to turn to the ITU because you can't look anywhere else. It's either the US, uh, through its, its companies enforcing US law on you, or it's some degree of control under the ITU. It's a question of, of bad and horrible. 
Um, the one uh, argument that was made to me by, by one industry representative is that at least whatever the United, mistake the United States makes, however bad it is, it has the capacity to fix it. The problem with the ITU is that when it makes a mistake, you have to wait 25 years for the committee to be formed in order to, to fix it. Um, I had a few comments about self-regulation, but I'll just leave it at that to allow the conversation. Okay. Just to... Thanks. Um, let's see who else wants to ask a question. And in the meantime, I'm sure all of you know, but the International Trade Committee will be voting on ACTA on Thursday. Ah, two gentlemen in the front. First, Christian Engstrom uh, from the Green Group here in the Parliament. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Christian Engstrom. I'm a member, member for the Pirate Party in the Green Group here in the Parliament. Uh, I'd like. Uh, it appears that there are, there are no representatives for, for Ethno here, but, but I would like to thank them anyway. Ethno is, of course, the, the, the lobbying organisation that, that organise. Uh, the big telecom providers primarily uh, tends to be the, one, the for, former state monopolies that are now, now privatized, uh, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, uh, other, others like that. Uh, it used to be that, that I, I felt very, very unsure about, about this, uh, should it be with the ICANN or should it be with the ITU? Because uh, as Joe McNamee was saying, yes, uh, the, the internet governance has wor worked good until now, but we do see these tendencies in, in, in the US to, to, to you, yeah, to, to export you with U.S. laws by, by, by uh, well, no, no, non -le non legal means, etc. So, so, I mean, that, that is concern. So, so then it was not natural to think, okay, perhaps the ITU could be a solution. And I, I used to think this up until one or two weeks ago, when I saw the proposal from Etno, where, where, where they're talk, talking about this thing that is mentioned in this paper, uh, that the sender pays. Now, to me, that is one one of uh, the most dangerous ideas at all, because what it would mean in effect is that big telcos would become gatekeepers who decide who is allowed to do business and who is not allowed to do business. We already have that problem in Europe. Uh, I mean, uh, again, Deutsche Telekom, Telefonica, and, and in particular the uh, Swedish Telia uh, are blocking uh, Skype, the, uh, the service that, that's owned by, by Microsoft. And they can do that uh, because, because the Commission uh, is dragging its feet about introducing legislation on net neutrality. It doesn't seem to be coming along. And in the meantime, uh, the big telcos can act as gatekeepers. Again, Skype, it's because it threatens the, the, the 20th century uh, business model, the, their legacy business, where, where they made loads and loads of money on overcharging for international co calls. Uh, but uh, they, can, they can just as easily use it uh, simply as a money grab. Because, because, I mean, today every single corporation is uh, dependent on having internet access. Uh, what, uh, if the telcos are, are allowed to say no to, to, uh, to any company at, at their will, uh, that of course may mean, uh, or if we have this principle that, that the sender pays, that means that big, big corporations send a lot of data. Uh, the telcos can, can just come knocking at the door, na name uh, an arbitrary price and say, either you pay or we shut you off from the internet. So I mean, yes, they, 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 they want to uh, punish uh, Skype and Microsoft because Skype threatens the legacy uh, revenues. But they also want, want to grab as much money as they can from Google because Google is perceived to be a quite rich company and, and they, they would want that money. Uh, and it used to be that I didn't understand that moving things to the ITU was a part of this plan to, to allow, allow the big telcos to, to do this. Now I do understand that. So, so I, I, uh, like I said, I would like to thank Etna for, for helping me re reach a firm and final <laughs> position on, on that one. But having said that, I mean, all the problems that Joe McNamee said with, with, with American legislators trying to, to use the current structure in order to... to give the U.S. control of the rest of the world. That still is a problem that needs to be resolved. And, and even, even if I, the ITU is not the solution, then what is? Look, I ended with a question, didn't I? Yes, you did. Uh, let's go to the next question. And just for, so everyone knows, we did approach uh, Edna. So. Yeah. Thank you. I am uh, Rik Falkvinge, a... Um, 
political activist in Sweden and employed as assistant here in the European Parliament. I would like to hear a bit of elaboration from the panel about the conflation, ongoing conflation, between a telecoms company and an internet service provider. The, I feel this conflation, and, and I argue that this conflation is illogical, counterproductive, and counter to public interest. When the internet was rolled out and we had early players across Europe and, frankly, the world, the early birds were mostly private companies, private entrepreneurs that had no existing baggage that rolled out fiber. And in countries where, which had a lot of these, we saw a very early uptake of household bandwidth that changed the public discourse dramatically on how this technology can or even should be used. <coughs> In contrast, where telcos and cable companies dominated the rollout of the internet, we can observe that these countries had a significantly delayed public discussion on the net, as well as uptake. So unfortunately, what happened in Europe was that the national old monopolies bought out all the innov innovative upstarts. We can now observe that the old telecom monopolies are mostly the internet players in Europe. And I argue this is very unfortunate because the, being an internet service provider and a provider of voice communications are two completely separate businesses, in particular voice communication over circuit switch. We can observe how absurd this conflation is if we look at the other industry that tried to roll out internet connectivity to households, meaning cable TV companies. If you look uh, in the discussion in the US, the uh, common question was if they had internet through cable or ADSL, as in did it come with a television subscription or with a telco subscription? Could you imagine if we would have this conflation between tel television companies and internet service providers? I can't, but yet this is as absurd as conflating telecom companies with internet service providers. And the reason, of course, this is, I argue, this is against the public interest, is that telecoms, the internet will destroy telecoms companies. It is absolutely absurd to be paying upwards of a euro for some international cause by the minute for a 9.6 kilobit connection that can only be used for voice transmissions. When I have 100 megabit flat, uncapped, unmetered, general purpose connectivity. So, we, we can observe that telecoms companies understand this and are doing their damnedest to delay the rollout of the internet because it will disintegrate their business. So I would like to hear the panel's reflections on this and whether this ITU move would be yet another attempt to conflate the telecoms industry and the internet service provider industry in a way that will prevent the, the uh, loss of money and some way of recouping this sunk money into obsolete investments. It's a very clear question. also relates to questions of net neutrality, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, and vertical bundling with Skype and so on. Yeah. So I'm just going to look at the panel. I had some requests to answer. So why don't we just go in, in order from my left to my right, and I'll look around the room for more questions as well as online. So um, Bill, do you want to start? Sure. Um, as the, I guess, um, American representative on the panel, I, I can, I had, my ears went up to uh, some of the points Joe was making, and I'd just like to um, suggest that the U.S. is, like other countries, uh, a big, diverse, complex place with a lot of players and a lot of interests. Um, <clears throat> The fact that you have certain industries that feel they're losing a lot of money to uh, 
downloads of their stuff and then jump up and down on certain congressmen's desks and say, look, we're not going to contribute as much to your reelection campaign unless you do something. And so then legislation gets introduced. Really doesn't mean that the U.S. is not still uh, stewarding the Internet's core resources in a responsible way. They're, they're quite separate processes. And bear in mind, SOPA and PIPA are not law. They're not law because a large coalition of competing interests in the United States and around the world mobilized against them. They're not law because within the Congress, people said, oh, this isn't going to work. This is overreaching. This is too far. Let's recalibrate, see if there's a way to defend intellectual property rights without damaging the DNS. They're not law because Obama said, I won't sign them. So all of that is really not an indicator that the U.S. can't perform the functions vis-a-vis -vis the management of the root zone file, uh, the oversight of the IANA function, uh, and the management of uh, n number blocks, or its contractual relationship with ICANN in a way that's responsible. In fact, I think the U.S. has been in recent years, and I'm not, you know, I'm a critic of U.S. policy in many ways on many fronts, but I think that there's been a real effort made in the past few years to become much more responsive to foreign governments' concerns. If you go to an ICANN meeting, it's astonishing to sit there and watch the uh, Assistant Secretary of Commerce, uh, Larry Strickling, basically chewing out the ICANN board in front of 1,500 people repeatedly for failing to do this and failing to do that in terms of meeting their obligations for transparency and so on. The U.S. government has gotten very aggressive in t pushing ICANN to do better, to be more responsive to the community, to open up their processes, to ensure their transparency. And the government has been working, I think, to try to get greater buy-in from other governments around the world. So I think that the direction of change has to be an evolutionary one. I'm one who would favor eventually seeing the transfer of those U.S. powers to some sort of globalized, global-level, multi-stakeholder process. But you can't do that through uh, some big intergovernmental treaty negotiation where U.N. agencies come in and try and put a gun to the U U.S. head and say, you know, you have to give up these functions. That's not going to work like that. It has to be something that people within the American political system and within the Internet community globally feel assured will maintain the stability and security and openness of the Internet. And nobody, quite frankly, has figured out a model to make that work yet. So that's one of the challenges. So I just wanted to say, don't worry too much. I agree with the thrust of what you said, but the, the part about, um, you know, they're going to abuse that I don't think that the administration will abuse its relationship to the root. So one, one point around uh, transparency, and uh, for us, this is the key uh, taking in consideration how censorship uh, has, uh, has increased in the last, in the last years. Um, we, have more, we have 40 countries uh, censoring the web, uh, heavily censoring the web in this moment around the world. Our effort around transparency in order to make, uh, uh, to make available all the data about the takedown requests that we are receiving, both for, for uh, various infringement of law and, and copyright, shows how the problem is bigger than just US and, and actually shows that the abuses around the world are quite consistent and the way sometimes law is enforced not uh, to um, uh, follow the priority that we have uh, we have uh, discussed before, so cybersecurity, child child pornography, but sometimes uh, more focusing on defamation and uh, and um, uh, other other local laws is is an important testimony that probably uh, can represent um, a good way to 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 get more information and more data around. Uh, Around the problem that were were raised by by Joe on on the discussion around um, 
the telcos and the industry and what uh, can be done. I think again, the commercial uh, commercial relationship are there to to uh, discuss possible issues and find out solution through through the market. And especially, this is a, a great example uh, of of uh, how uh, uh, mature and grown up uh, companies and industry should uh, sit down on the table and sort out uh, the, the different issues that we have on the table, and probably also try to exploit the opportunities. And uh, from from our side, there is the maximum. Uh, uh, openness to do so uh, in, in a very transparent and open way. Uh, and it's, a, it's a kind of illogical deposition of uh, asking for less regulation, as you said, on fields uh, like uh, net neutrality, for example, or, or broadband, and asking for more regulation for peering agreement. So it's, um, I think, again, there, there are a lot of room for improving uh, the commercial relationship between the different subjects in the ecosystem with uh, uh, thinking mainly about new business model and less about uh, how to grow uh, against uh, in the, the interests of the others. Thank you. Um, uh, on Rick's point, first, I think um, I've, I think there are four different types of ISP or, or um, telco these days. Uh, there are companies that, that are almost extinct, the, the pure telcos. There are the, the big um, telco slash ISPs. Um, they don't have to be former incumbents, uh, Vodafone being, being an example. Um, these are increasingly seeing a, um, an interest in, in becoming gatekeepers. Um, the interest in becoming gatekeepers is also multiple. Um, there's, there's, an interest, there's an interest in keeping people out, an interest in keeping people in. Um, if, if, you, if you're providing um, internet access for a very big user base, then profiling of people on the way out of their network, as, uh, of your network as they're doing whatever they're doing, as uh, the form uh, technology that was almost launched in the UK shows, uh, is very interesting. Um, if you're providing... Um, services, whether it's uh, telephony, keeping Skype out, whether it's um, uh, content services, um, it's, intra it's useful to, to keep, the, uh, keep the gate closed and to have a gate. Then you've got smaller ISPs that have a, a different business model because they can't make money out of the size of their user base because their user base isn't big enough. And then you have the, the online companies. Um, now, the thing that, that disturbs me, and um, as uh, Andrea pointed out, I've been saying this ad nauseum to, to the Commission, um, with a lot of the, the self-regulatory initiatives, is uh, the Commission has got this frustrating habit of, of saying to industry, do something, um, and do something nice, please. Uh, and the, the, the big uh, ISP slash telcos go, Hmm. Well, we could restrict access to that bad stuff and this bad stuff and that bad stuff over there. Um, and um, the smaller ISPs go, but that's actually no use. But it does sound nice. And so um, you end up with the commission running the risk of being gamed in the process. And I never attend um, a self-regulation meeting in the commission where there are people from the uh, competition side of uh, DG Info uh, policing that process. Uh, I do think that, that there is a logic in conflating telcos and, and ISPs uh, uh, because it's, it's an Annie to any, both are Annie to any communication services. They're very different Annie to any services, um, but it's not the same as, as TV. Um, even when I try to be nice, apparently I can't. Um, <laughs> um, I didn't say <laughs> I, I didn't say that the U.S. can't continue its stewardship. I said that recent initiatives are raising concerns, raising worries. Um, and yes, thankfully, and thanks to uh, some wonderful activism in the U.S., um, SOPA, PIPA, Koika and who knows ACTA and anything else that ends in A, except Andrea will <laughs> not make it to, uh, to any position of power. 
But, um, but if, we, if we look at the WikiLeaks uh, incident, um, WikiLeaks was doing something the US government didn't like. Uh, with indirect political pressure, um, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal withdrew their services. Their web hosting was removed. Their domain name was not renewed. Um, there's a new initiative uh, between the White House and from, um, IPR enforcement czar and the payment providers to undertake extraterritorial, extrajudicial, um, punitive measures against uh, companies outside the US. Um, VeriSign, another US company, asked and then retracted its request uh, for the power to annihilate dot-com domain uh, sites anywhere in the world if it felt if, if so inclined and um, and apologies again uh, I keep I, I have every time um, Marco attends a meeting he hears me saying the same thing but um, Google uh, enforces the uh, DMCA globally um, if you want to appeal a decision uh, you need to put yourself under US jurisdiction there are people who don't live in the US who feel a little bit peeved about, about this, and you can understand why, as, as wise as Google may be in its, uh, in its punitive measures. Um, so the more of these things that pile up, the more people say, I don't really want to be subject to not alone US law, but private company interpretations of what the law might mean. And a lot of the stuff that's done by private companies, and this comes to the point that Richard made at the beginning of the, the panel, about constitutions and laws, a lot of what's proposed couldn't actually happen under law um, because of the US First Amendment and, and uh, the uh, lesser known Article 52 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. I'm, I'm increasingly appalled and infuriated by the European Commission asking companies to volunteer to do things that are prohibited by the, by the Charter of Fundamental Rights. There was a, there's a, a thing called the CEO Coalition on making the internet a safer place for children. Little angels fly around the room during the meeting, it's lovely. Um, in that meeting, in that coalition meeting, the, before last, there was a, um, uh, an intervention by somebody from the European Commission. And uh, he explained that because of a, a court ruling from last year, the Scarlet Sabam case, uh, ISPs cannot be required to, uh, to have mass um, filtering and blocking of content on the networks. However, he went on to explain, if ISPs, if you ISPs volunteer to do this, then that's absolutely fine. And at the most recent CEO coalition, uh, another person from another part of the commission suggested that um, widespread upload filters on, on European connections would be a good idea. Um, we've completely lost the law and democratic legitimacy somewhere along the line. And if, if that's us, then if that's what can be expected from us, then we don't have much credibility when it comes to discussions about supporting the rule of law and supporting democracy uh, in global governance. And that's a worry. So we all love self-regulation. That is clear. <clears throat> and we're all in agreement how to do it. Um, let me just point out, I, I don't want to open the discussion here because it is an interesting discussion, certainly for me, but it's something that would take us, uh, I'm afraid, a lot longer than the time that we have now. Uh, but as Joe and others say, my, my phone number and my door is always open for this discussion, even though I, I don't deal directly with some of these processes, but at least for an intellectual conversation, I'm always available. But let me point out uh, what I see as a slight uh, 
conundrum in which the Commission is in, not only the Commission, by the way, which is, on the one hand, we have been, we have been uh, told for years and years and years by Internet activists, by companies, by the whole world, that we better not touch the Internet with regulation uh, with a stick. And on the other hand, when we tell companies, fine, then organize yourself uh, and do something which we all agree has to be done, then uh, we should regulate. Now, I'm exaggerating, and I personally get Adrian Joe's point. Uh, um, I think it's got by more people than you may believe, but my point is that this is not an easy situation in which we are in, and it will take some time to find what is the proper balance. And I personally think that criticism is always welcome, if it is civil criticism, as Joe's criticism always is. Uh, it's very persistent, I must say, but it's very civil <laughs> criticism. Uh, I, uh, I take the occasion to, to remind or perhaps tell people who don't know that the Commission has very recently opened a, a consultation on, I think it's called the uh, Good Practice or Good Code of Conduct for self and regulation which is an attempt I'm sure Joe would have a lot to say about that attempt, but it is an attempt to try and understand what would be the best mechanism to employ self-regulation. Uh, let us be clear, if people in this room or elsewhere of European citizens tell us self-regulation has failed, uh, and what you have to do is to regulate, as the Commission is to go down very heavily and regulate, uh, then we might do it. But this is not what we were told since 10 years that we should do. Now, moving a, a bit aside from the, uh, from the specific topic of self-regulation, uh, I, I must admit that I, I haven't completely understood the point made by, uh, by Mr. Falvinga on the conflation between telecom providers and ISPs, uh, because uh, uh, in my view there are, uh, I mean, the categorization is quite clear, and actually Joe has made, uh, has made in my view, a good categorization. Uh, if the point is about uh, cross-ownership uh, of different uh, functions and activities by companies and the competition concerns or the market concerns uh, or even the fundamental rights concern that this could, uh, uh, this could entail, then we may discuss whether we have the instruments uh, to, to fight that. If, for example, you have a company that is at the same time owns the pipe and owns the services on top of it and has a dominant position and abuses that dominant position, then in my view we do have the instruments in European law to approach that. Then one might uh, agree or not whether those instruments are effective, fast enough, etc. And this is why most of the time we prefer to push more on ex ante, uh, an ex-ante approach rather than on uh, an ex-post. I think that somebody on, on this very topic, I, I don't remember who it was, uh, said that we are very, I think it was you, Joe, it's uh, always from you, uh, that we are very comfy with telecom operators and we treat telecom operators very respectfully and friendly. Well, allow me to disagree, because uh, if you look at the record of our competition cases, if you look at how we are addressing telecom operators to convince them, or in some cases we are even uh, uh, we are even uh, um, thinking how to force them to invest in new broadband. I wouldn't say that this relationship is so uh, so comfy as I think I understood. And uh, to to conclude my point. Oh, sorry, one one very short point made. Uh, one short answer made by on the point made by MEP Engstrom. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert in uh, settlement and accounting rates in telecommunication. We have an entire directorate in my DG who is happy to do this stuff. And when I was given a job at the commission, I was given the option to work there and said, no, thank you, I don't want to work there. But on the point of sender pays, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, my understanding, and I'm glad to stand corrected if I'm wrong, even now, uh, telco, especially a former uh, dominant telecommunication operator, could easily tell uh, a content provider, we know what your IP addresses are, we know what your autonomous system numbers are, either you pay us this amount of money or our customers will not reach you. They can do it already now. The point why they're, the reason why they're not doing it is that it would be a commercial suicide. Because if whatever European or American or whomever else Telecom operators tell its customers that you can't reach Google from now on, and I'm mentioning Google only because we have a friend from Google here, a colleague from Google here. I don't want to think how customers would react. So I, I'm not sure that whatever Ethno says, uh, which is what Ethno says, by the way, and they are a private organization and they have their opinion, whatever Ethno says in the context of the, of the wicked, I, I personally see it more as a political posturing than something that would actually change what is already possible today 
with the current rules that we have. And then I will have a final point, but I think that Map uh, Angstrom wanted to, to react, and I would be happy to. Just pointing out, it is already happening with Skype. They have started blocking Skype, so I mean, it's not a far-fetched scenario in, in any way, I would say. Indeed, but the point I'm making is that I don't see what would change with uh, the kind of uh, very weak language that Ethnos is proposing, because Ethnos language is, and we have to consider different accounting and settlement scenarios, including uh, sender pays. This is what I read from the press release. But it's not my job to defend Ethnos proposal, to be absolutely clear. It's their proposal, it's their ideas, and they, they certainly have the means to discuss uh, that idea. And just pointing out that uh, perhaps we have to be careful not to, uh, I think that's Bill Drake's uh, points on not overstating what is going to happen in the wicket, but not being naive either is a very fair point. In this particular case, without being naive, I don't quite see the, the major problem of this proposal compared to the situation that we already have today in terms of what can or cannot be done. And <clears throat> to conclude my observation, if I still have two or three minutes uh, and I'm looking at our moderator, yes, I still have. Um, as, a general, uh, as a general point, uh, Very often, when, when you discuss with certain uh, intellectual circles in the internet governance arena, you get this, uh, um, this opposing uh, characterization between uh, multi-stakeholderism and multilateralism, as if multilateralism was the opposite of multi-stakeholderism. The point is that, in my view at least, uh, uh, with the kind of problems that we have to deal with, uh, with a technology that is by nature cross-border, with jurisdiction that are still mostly national, and I say mostly because let's not forget that we are sitting in an institution uh, in the room or one of the institution of a supranational system. So as the EU, we do have a bit of experience on how to deal with these problems of cross-border uh, technologies and activities and national legislation. But this aside, we have complex issues. Uh, we either tell, we either decide that there is, uh, we trust, uh, whomever one single entity, whether it's the US government or another government, it's company X or company Y or company Z, to decide what is right or what is wrong. Or we try to find instruments to discuss collectively, multilaterally, these issues. Now, I will make one example simply because, I, one, I like to tease Marco, and second, because Google uh, just published its transparency report. Now, what Google does with the transparency report uh, is uh, to be praised without doubts. Google is one of the most transparent companies in this environment uh, that I know of, at least. However, I, when reading the transparency report, uh, there are a couple of things, there were a couple of things that really struck me. Google, uh, when presenting the results of the transparency report, talks about censorship of political content. And Marco will correct me if anything I say is wrong. Now, who gets to decide what is political content or not? On the other hand, Google says that uh, child pornography is automatically removed from its systems, which we may agree or not is a good idea or not, but still it's a decision, it's a unilateral decision by Google who gets to decide what is child pornography or not. Furthermore, Google, and this is stated in a transparency report, it's in that report, also says that hate speech is not permitted on Blogspot, the blogger service, on Blogger, I think, the blogging service of Google. Again, who gets to decide what is hate speech or not? Now, I don't want this to sound as an attack on Google because, as I said, what Google is trying to do with the transparency report is very positive, and we should do it more. What I'm uh, pointing out uh, is that a transparency report made by one company, which is anyway applying its own policies on what is freedom of expression, on what is permissible speech, etc., is not good enough. It may be good for me, it may be good for people in this room, it may be good for the US citizens, it may be good, et cetera, but rest assured, it's not good for Chinese citizens, it's not good for Indian citizens, it's not good for Brazilian citizens, it's not good for four-fifths of citizens of this world. Now, if you want to get into discussion with this four-fifths of citizens in the world who will become internet users very soon, then you have to have the institutions to do it. And to echo what, uh, what Bill said, that the reason why we're not progressing enough uh, towards a more multilateral approach on internet governance is that because nobody until now, and I agree, has found, uh, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue discussing, but nobody has found a good alternative to the current mostly, mostly US-based setup. Well, somebody show me what is the alternative to the current multilateral institutions to try to get six billion people to somehow 
arrive at some form of agreement of what is freedom of expression, of what is acceptable consumer protection, etc., etc. Because, I mean, we need to take a political decision here, I'm very clear. Because either we say, fine, we are fine with the kind of situation which is not a multilateral, mostly not a multilateral situation, we may be fine with it. But then let's stop discussing it. Let's say that we're fine with it. If we're not fine with it, then we need to find the institution to do it. The institution to do it, the best institution that we have as a species, as a human species, that we have come up with is the United Nations system, plus some others for specific, like the World Trade Organization, etc. Show me the alternative, and then we can discuss the alternative. Until I see the alternative, I will continue to say that at least we must include not saying that that has to be the only place where we discuss, but we also have to include the United Nations system as a whole, which means all the various agencies, organizations, etc., in these discussions. And with this, uh, I think I exhausted my time. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Marco wanted to respond briefly, and then we'll go to a question from uh, the audience again. Go ahead, Marco. Yeah, super quickly, and, and, and to clarify a few points. So the transparency report is uh, registering the request that we are receiving. So subpoena and request from from uh, um, right owners for what concern DMCA and other copyright laws across the world. It's it's a picture of the situation, uh, so it does not reflect uh, the Google policy, but does reflect the laws that we are encountering on the world. Some some of the comments that you mentioned, Andrea, are basically interpretation from from the data. I agree with you that can be interpretation, but I strongly suggest all of you to look into the data and come with your own interpretation. Uh, and uh, on, on the general point about uh, the need for third party institution to take over the transparency effort, we are totally supportive of it. Actually, we launched the transparency report because we want institution to take over it and, and provide a, a really comprehensive transparency report of all the requests of take down content of content online. So we are completely supportive of, of a request uh, going in this direction. In relation of the, of, of the institution that could play this role, we believe that we need to work all on the structure of the IGF, because so far the IGF has done a great job in, in including in the discussion uh, people around the world, experts, academics, and coming also with sometimes with very good stuff that does not get the right visibility, like, for example, the Internet Right and Principle Charter that uh, was produced is a great paper, but didn't get the visibility and the attention that it deserved. Okay, hello. My name is Marcel Christophan, um, and I would like to reflect on this. Hold on, sorry, Andrea wanted to respond back oh, to sorry. Marco, and then you, <laughs> you can go ahead. I deeply apologize, I will take just uh, 30 seconds. Uh, very quickly, Marco. What I said now is not an interpretation. The fact that Google says in the frequently asked questions of the transparency report that it, it does remove hate speech from its blogging service is written black and white or whatever are the colors of your monitor on the website of Google. So that is not my interpretation. That is Google policy as it, he, it expresses it. And on the AGF, we fully agree. I would, and actually the commission is one of the main financial funders of the AGF. Unlike countries which defend very much the multi-stakeholder model, but quite frankly don't put the money where the mouth is, allow me to say this, and it's large countries on our west. Um, but let's not forget that the AGF is one of the results of a United Nations process, the World Summit on the Information Society. The hated United Nations managed to produce something which we all agree is one of the best models that we have to discuss these issues. So let's keep this in mind. Okay, so now Bill wanted to respond to Andrea first, just to keep the line of the conversation yes, understandable. Yes, I, I just wanted to be, sorry, just briefly wanted to make sure I heard you correctly because I'm not sure if I did. Um, you referred to the ETNO proposals before, right? And you said that you thought that they were basically not worse than what we have now? Is that what I understood? Yes, okay. I, I just I just want to be clear about this. Um, right now, we don't have a multilateral treaty um, for 190 countries that uh, applies to all providers of internet services and requires them to negotiate commercial agreements based on fair compensation, respecting the principle of sender party network pays. Um, 
And I would think that that would not be a good thing for the internet. Um, and it's a substantial change from what we have now. What we have now is a system of peering and interconnection in which one doesn't engage in th those activities. It's not obliged by international regulatory fiat to do so, particularly not subject to uh, um, an agreement that in some versions would also give the ITU dispute settlement powers and so on. Um, so to me, this is a, and to a lot of people I know, this is a really remarkable proposal for change in something fundamental to the internet. And your, and your view is that it's okay? My view is that first of all, this is Etno's proposal, so Etno will uh, argue pro or contra this proposal. The commission is not going to take a position on this proposal, not now at least. But I don't know if you had the proposal in front of you because what I read said including sender pays. So that there should be the possibility for sender pays in this sense, and I may be wrong, but if there is the possibility for sender pays, that's an option that is open. From this point of view, I frankly, personally, I frankly don't see a major difference from what we have today because as I said, even today, if you have enough commercial leverage, you can make sure that the content provider will pay you. The point is that most of these things today happen and we don't know about them because there is no transparency in this kind of commercial agreements between private parties. But if the text, because I don't have the text in front of me, Bill, if the text says that only the sender pays mm -hmm. principle should apply, then I would agree, yes, that should, would not be acceptable, but not be acceptable because it would be imposing one particular commercial model of uh, intercarrier relationships through international treaties, which is not something the commission believes in. If it's put as a possibility, frankly, and again, I'm not an expert in the matter, but frankly, I would say, well, is it really necessary to put it? And this is why, in my view, what Ethno is doing is simply highlighting, as they have been doing in the past, a larger problem from their perspective, which is that they claim that content operators are free riding on their resources. And I keep on underlining this is what they claim. This is not what the Commission has taken a position on at the moment. But again, we can, as I said, I don't have, I, uh, frankly, even though I kind of work on the wicket, I don't remember by heart all the proposals that come up from the wicket. But if it's including the possibility of applying sender pays, it's something that I wouldn't think is so problematic. But I'm happy to be convinced of the contrary. Yeah. Just to clarify, um, it says uh, that uh, there shall be, uh, uh, they shall negotiate commercial agreements to achieve a sustainable system of fair compensation. So that means everyone shall negotiate commercial relationships based on fair compensation, which presumes a shift in the way things are done now. And that's across the board. And it says, and where appropriate, respecting the principle of, which once you add that into the context that people are obliged to ga engage in a negotiate, commercial negotiation in which a fair compensation means somebody is de facto by the wording being expected to give more money to somebody else. And this then becomes one of the techniques on which that gets calculated. It will make it much more of a feature of the life of all, uh, and, and of course, you know, it will generate a lot of conflict. And then the question will be, how, how do we resolve that? If you have major telecommunications carriers in Europe demanding that um, foreign-based carriers that have companies that are originating traffic from within their national jurisdiction have to pay them more money and because they've got a treaty that says that, <coughs> you can imagine that the level of conflict that's going to be generated around this, which doesn't exist now, is going to be substantially higher. So it's just something to to worry about. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna uh, give the floor to the <laughs> patient <laughs> person. It was a fascinating to watch, so I'm, I'm happy to wait. Um, thank you. So I, w I wanted to reflect on um, what I heard uh, earlier. Um, the, uh, you have been hearing to not regulate the internet for the last 10 years, and I want to emphasize this also in the next 10 years, but the misunderstanding here is actually um, the regulation of the companies 
that are interfering with the free flow of information on the internet. They should be actually regulated, and I think we called for that in the last 10 years as well. And let me point out that uh, what the Commission and, for example, ACTA, SOPA, PIPA, and the others, the self-regulation that they're calling for of the um, internet service providers, if there would be no call for that, but if they would be doing that on their own, then actually that should be also um, uh, part of the regulation. So um, if anyone is doing that on uh, uh, of the ISPs, this kind of uh, interfering with the free flow of, of the information on the internet, that should be something actually that should be regulated. And I think this ties very deeply into the theme that um, Joe is always uh, playing on his flute. Um, so uh, actually, I would encourage you to uh, regulate the companies, not the internet, and regulate them in a way to uh, pro prohibit them to interfere with the free flow of information on the internet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're at a point where we can wrap it up. And I want to thank all of you for participating actively uh, online and here in the room. Um, and I'll just end with a few final thoughts because this is clearly a discussion that's not over. Um, but I would encourage everyone not to depend our discussions and thinking and strategizing on ad hoc situations, uh, which present sort of a crisis or an emerging threat or whatever, but to try to also um, look at what kind of goals we have in the long term or at least try to express those um, um, in a multi-stakeholder uh, environment, so to kind of optimize this process. Um, and for me at least, but this is because uh, I'm not only thinking about myself, but the context of this parliament where a lot of people uh, will not necessarily be familiar with issues of internet governance or technology or the internet at all, uh, that it would actually be very helpful, and maybe we can do this in kind of a collaboration with a number of people to map the issues that are at stake because even in this discussion we heard many different issues going back and forth. So from telecom regulation within the EU to geopolitical considerations in international fora, for example, or uh, things like that. Uh, and to map sort of areas of influence and jurisdiction or areas of regulation or areas of market power and to really see what this field is even looking at, uh, looking like. I think that would be very helpful because then we could see uh, where the points of conflict might be and where there is even a need for anything new. Um, because some of the um, uh, points that you made about uh, regulating companies are already perfectly possible in the context of, let's say, anti-competition or uh, things like that. And we already have some fundamental rights guarantees which may well apply already to, to the new environment of the internet. So let's see what we need or perhaps what barriers we need to break down. We can also look at it the other way, but it's easier to, to look at when we know what we're looking at so that everybody's also looking at the same assessment, uh, preferably done by a credible group of people or an independent um, actor. Uh, and then I would hope that we can include more and more people in this conversation because that's really needed. I think a lot of people who would peek their head around the corner uh, would not understand what we're talking about. And we have to be realistic about that. Uh, I I'm learning, so I'm not saying that that's uh, bad, but there's a lot of people who don't have these issues on their radar, even if they're very important. Um, so without seeking to overregulate, because as someone who, who's you know, a liberal politician, that's sort of uh, something I'm allergic to. Um, but we do have to be aware, and, and a lot of my time I spend on looking at international affairs and, and the role Europe should play in the world, that our values and even discussions like this about how our multi-stakeholder process should be and whether or not the Commission should intervene or whether or not the Parliament should even address these issues or what roles companies have, are a symptom or an expression of democracy. It's possible because we can speak freely, it's possible because we believe in multi-stakeholder uh, processes. And there's a lot of players uh, where uh, what may sound like multi-stakeholder is probably actually single stakeholder and relates to economic power, political power, um, uh, etc. So we should pr be aware, I think, of the geopolitical context. and. Um, one approach could be to only act when we're prompted to, but that also means that we leave 
quite a big field, wide open to challenge or even attack, if you want to call it that. Um, and some of these issues need to be raised at the political level because they don't only relate to internet governance, but also to broader relations between company, uh, countries, I'm sorry, to uh, the extraterritorial impact, not only on uh, internet or technology related issues, but for example, um, uh, sanction regimes or other kinds of extraterritorial impact. So that's where I believe the political level is important to include, uh, where context is important and where we have to continue to keep in mind uh, what democratic oversight means, what laws mean in the current time, and also how we can deal with conflict of interest or redress or arbitration. I think that that's something that we haven't really touched upon today, but would be important to look at. So I've learned a lot, but I've also found more questions that need to be answered somehow. Uh, and I hope this was the beginning of a, of a discussion. I know that there will be more meetings on the EU's strategy or the EU's role vis-a-vis -vis internet governance before the next internet governance uh, forum meeting in Baku later this year, and um, um, several subsets of questions will inevitably uh, be addressed, so I hope we can continue to, uh, to talk about these important topics, and I would again want to thank everyone who made the effort and took the time to do so today. So thanks and have a good rest of your afternoon.